we have our sample asset, the mangelin on. And this will serve as a good review on how to prepare a growth mesh. We have our final game mesh, and then we also have our guide curves, which were output from shave and a haircut. And as you can see, fur is not intended to be on the whole character. So there's areas that we can avoid on the growth mesh. There's two main methods that we can use to deal with this. We'll just go in the wireframe overlay. And we'll use the head as an example. So one of the first things you notice is the tusks and the mouth cavity. Uh, there won't be fur on these areas, so we can just go ahead and remove them. The second area, uh, the eyes, uh, which will not have fur, we can reduce the amount of detail up here so that we don't have as much geometry going into the growth mesh. And if I turn off our game mesh and turn on the growth mesh, you can see the difference here. Nothing in the mouth, no tusks, and less geometry in the eye. Either method is acceptable. It's probably a lot easier to just go ahead and remove geometry if you know you're never going to want fur there. It is destructive, so if you do remove it, you will not be able to put hair there unless you rebuild the growth mesh from scratch. As to where removing detail in some areas is a little more forgiving if you change your mind and decide you want fur there later. Another thing to keep in mind is that your skinning envelopes for both your growth mesh and your render mesh must have the same bones in them, or at least a subset. So if your render skeleton has 80 bones, legs, spine, head, tail, and all that stuff, then your growth mesh at least needs to have a subset of those bones. It cannot have any bones that are not already in the game's mesh. Here we have our human male character, and this groom is for Todd, which is just a spike hair. It's fairly simple, so when we made the growth mesh, when we made the growth mesh, it didn't need to be very dense. There's not a lot of fidelity in this hairstyle. This helps keep the guide management down, so it's easier to deal with less guides. And it also keeps the memory footprint down in the APX file. However, if you need to use more guides for higher fidelity haircuts, it is completely acceptable to use a higher density topology in your growth mesh. You can have different resolutions of growth meshes, as we talked about before. However, it is important to find a good balance between the density of topology on your growth mesh and what fidelity you need for the groom of your haircut. For example, if you get too broad of topology on your growth mesh, then in order to make that hair dense, you need to turn up your, your, your density or your interpolation of your hair guides quite a bit. And if you have to do this to an extreme value, at the other end of the spectrum, if you use a whole lot of guides and very low density for interpolation, that can also be expensive because you're putting a lot of hair guides into the asset. So it's important to find a good middle ground for this. And sometimes it takes a little experimentation with different assets. This character, for example, with just a simple spiked haircut, didn't need a lot of hair guides. So this kept our growth mesh pretty coarse. It's also important to note that in our sample files, we included two growth meshes for the human males. One of them is a coarse mesh for simpler hairstyles. And we even included the facial area in case you wanted to do any beards. So you can just delete whatever areas you don't want to use. And then also a finer mesh if you wanted to do more complex hairstyles that required more guides. And of course these can be altered in any way that you would need to to create your hairstyle. On the sample asset Fiona, we used a couple of tricks to be able to control the interpolation on the guide hairs. And what we did is on the growth mesh is we made some cuts where we wanted different sections of hair to be combed from where we want our parts to be. So if we go to our Hairworks viewer to look at the, the final asset, we can see that there's a section of bangs right here and there's a part on the left side of her head 
which smoothly interpolates all the way around to the other side and it overlaps the bangs. By putting a cut into the growth mesh right here, we're telling HairWorks that it cannot interpolate across this gap. It can only interpolate where there is a connected edge or a connected face between the guides. So that's why if we go down to our edit poly, this is a section of hair, and this is all a section of hair, but we have a nice part here on the left side, and the hair interpolates all the way around the outside edge. Now you can see here we've got another section down here. Now we never see this division here, however it does allow us to control a little bit of layering in the hair. So if we go back to our HairWorks asset, I can turn off the graphics mesh, and we can go over and turn our growth mesh on on the crown. Oops. Show graphics mesh, there we go. And we can see exactly what's going on here. So our cut in the growth mesh influences the interpolation of the guides in this area. We can turn on the guides too. And we get some nice overlapping over the bangs. And then you can see here in silhouette how we get like these two little kind of defined um, layers of hair from having this, this cut right here. And then turn our graphics mesh back on and see our final haircut. Now another thing to note is there's actually two assets on this character because this character has some very short hair on the neck and instead of allowing this these short hairs to be interpolated into really long hairs um, which would waste a lot of CVs on the short hair we just treated it as a separate asset and this is actually a little bit more effective.